Well, good morning. Welcome to week one of our annual Mission Focus. I'm very excited this month. Uh, my name is Ted Burrows. I'm pastor of Mission and Discipleship here at Modesto Covenant. So um, great to see so many familiar faces and, and great to see some new faces as well. Um, my, my hope and prayer is that God will meet us in this place uh, today and, and the Sundays to come as we explore God's word and what God is doing in, in mission in this world and in our lives and how he calls us to that mission um, as, as we explore the first chapter in the book of John. And I also hope that everybody takes an opportunity to, to, to engage in missions or to serve in missions or, or, or to learn more about what's happening or um, have a, meals with, a, a meal with missionaries uh, just as a, as a wonderful way to continue to grow and engage in God's work. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. In the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. With Genesis 1 in mind, we now turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John is the fourth gospel in the New Testament, so it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and it's immediately before the book of Acts. John chapter 1, verse 1, it starts, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen. Ah. And wonder. I do not know of any other posture that somebody can have when viewing those, those Hubble images, those pictures of, of space. Um, the first two images that we saw were, were something that uh, scientists call the pillars of creation. It is a stunning image of, of the birth of stars and these spectacular clouds of power and, and energy and mass. We, we see the vastness of the universe in these pictures. And each, each speck is, is, is tiny, but within each speck is um, an entire galaxy, entire worlds. These, these images look almost false to us. Um, nothing can be so beautiful, we think. It, it, it's almost as if they're so beautiful that we cannot fully comprehend the glory. We stand in awe and wonder. John's first century readers would have immediately made that connection back to Genesis 1, the beginning of the grand story of God's creation and the covenant with this world. They would have recognized that connection between, between those first recorded words in the Bible of God, where God says, let there be light, and John's depiction of the word of God, who was himself the light of all humankind. Awe and wonder. I'm going to ask the, the um, thanks, Scott. Let there be light. I always think that when I, when I ask, let there be light. But we stand in awe and wonder when we read these passages. What does John mean here that the word, or logos in Greek, that the word was with God, the word was God? Just as my word is inseparable from who I am, so also is the word inseparable from who God is. N.T. Wright says that in the Old Testament, God regularly acts by means of his word. What he says happens. In Genesis itself, in Genesis itself and regularly thereafter, um, by the word of the Lord, says the psalm, the heavens were made. 
God's word is the one thing that will last, even though people and plants wither and die. God's word will go out of his mouth and bring life, healing, and hope to Israel and to all of creation. That's part of John's choice of the word, word, here in his text. Now, another layer of meaning to, to Logos um, is that John was writing in a time when some of the reigning philosophies looked for, meaning, looked for the meaning of life in the abstract notion of reason and logic. The, that idea that uh, reason and logic, or, or Logos, were behind everything, that reason and logic give meaning to our existence. Now John takes these philosophies and he turns them on their head. Yes, he says, the Logos is behind everything. The Logos does give meaning to our existence. But it is not that abstract Logos of the ancient philosophers. It is a personal Logos. That, that Logos, the word is, of course, the person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The word has his fingerprints over everything in all of creation. The word gives meaning to our existence. A person. Awe and wonder. These verses of John serve as a threshold to the life of Jesus. They, they're the first rays of dawn that gives, um, that, that, that gives us a fresh vision as the new day awakens, a sign of things to come, a precursor to something yet even more glorious. But before we look to the light, let us first look to that theme of darkness. In Genesis, um, the darkness was, was a nothingness, a, a void before creation. But here in John, we, we get the sense that the darkness is something within creation. It is that reality of sin and brokenness, that reality of separation from God. This darkness is oppressive, it is suffocating, it is life-sucking. Even in our modern times, it is not difficult to find the dark places of this world. Turn on your television, read the news. Uh, you'll, you'll read stories about how cartoonists in France were murdered by by extreme terrorists. You'll, you'll read of plane crashes killing hundreds of people or getting lost. It seems to happen almost every other week. Uh, we, we read of, of children starving around the world. Entire people groups face genocide, like the Yazidis in Iraq and the Karen in Myanmar. There's war, famine, corruption, slavery. Some of the darkest corners of the world are even right here in America a country which um, was once called a, city, a shining city on a hill by President Reagan. The reality is that corporations ravage land and people to satisfy shareholders. Communities rage over issues of race, poverty, and injustice. Families are ripped apart by selfishness and sin. And individuals are haunted by past mistakes, present frustrations, and future unknowns. I recently attended something called a Poetry Slam, a competition where poets performed in a style close to rap. It's not for everyone, I know. But I had a great time. And the thing that I loved about this event was that each poem was autobiographical. Each poem dealt with the hard challenges in life. These poets were honest, bearing their souls as they spoke this raw truth about the darkness surrounding them. Issues like anxiety, grief, insecurity, anger, Nothing was left hidden. The content was not particularly uplifting, but the poet's collective courage to name the unspeakable was a breath of fresh air in, in a culture that likes to hold our breath and pretend that nothing is wrong. Yet even though I applaud the lament of these poets, I lament the hopelessness that was so common in their poems. Only rarely did I catch a glimmer of hope in the darkness. The evening was both beautiful and heartbreaking at the same time. But I am encouraged to know that there is hope. It is into the darkest darkness that God shines his brightest light. 
The mission of God is to illuminate. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. So however hopeless it may seem, the darkness really has nothing over the light, because it is just that. It is nothing. Darkness itself does not exist. It is not an entity. It is not measurable. Darkness is actually just the absence of light. If there is no light, then there is darkness. So if darkness were the only option, then despair is a logical conclusion. But we do have this hope, this light shining in the darkness, who invites us to live in him and challenges us to live for him. Indeed, life is only life as it was meant to be if it is lived in the light of life. As you know, the writings of John extend beyond this gospel. John also wrote some very personal pastoral letters in which he continues this theme of of light and, and love and life. In the first letter of John, we read, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live in the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood, of his Je- the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. So during our mission focus this month, it, the, the, the first thing that I would ask each one of us to consider, myself included, is to receive this light of God more and more in our own lives. Because we cannot talk about missions and being missionaries and doing great things for God if we do not come to terms first with the darkness in our own hearts and receive his life-giving light to invite him to do great things in our lives. It can be a scary thing, I know, to go under that revelatory light of God. Many of us perhaps have gotten used to the darkness. Uh, we, We almost find comfort there in those unexposed corners, those secrets, We hide there, but there is no life there in the darkness. True life is only found in Jesus Christ. And again, we we have hope and not despair because John says that to all who did receive the light, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This is for all people. This invitation is for everyone. And it is It is when and only when that we live in the light of God that we can then reflect the light of God. Indeed, this is God's intention that we should be so alive in him that we would overflow with light, shining as bright stars in a sea of darkness. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. This is the real light of the world. Neither do people put a light Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This here is the bedrock of Christian mission. Think of a a candle's flame. A a candle's flame doesn't need to try hard to shine, to, to try harder, it just shines. That's what, that's what it does. Uh, shining is integral to its identity. You, you can hide it under a bowl and you can try to hide its light, but that's a silly thing to do, and, and doing so renders it completely useless. That's not the point of it. And in the same way, mission is an integral part of our identity as Christians, as the church. We, can, we, we, we cannot take mission out of discipleship. Shining the light of God is inseparable from living in the light. When Jesus said, you are the light of the world, it is a call to bear his light to the darkest corners of the world. Now earlier I listed a a slew of problems in the world. Um, What is our response to these issues? Where is the church in the face of genocide? Where is the church when it comes to injustice? I praise God for the mission and ministry of this church. I'm I'm honored to to be a part of it. 
I praise God for that united vision that he gives us to be a beacon of light to our neighbors. I praise him for the unique callings that he gives to each one of us. Some of us are light amongst the poor here in Modesto. Some of us are light amongst the lost overseas. Some of us are light to those facing genocide. But even though there is a cause for celebration, and and we should celebrate, each one of us would also do well to continually ask God where and how he wants us to shine his light. As he said at the dawn of creation, let there be light. So God also says to the church, you are the light of the world. So let there be you. And through you, let God illuminate. Amen.